Greetings and welcome to Union Money. I'm Brian Hurst, and tonight our topic deals with healthcare. At retirement, there are three components that need to be taken care of. Home needs to be paid for, no debt, and adequate healthcare program. Just to put a few numbers to healthcare, if medical aids increase at 9% a year, which is approximately 3 to 4% above inflation, a couple in eight years' time will be paying double, and in 16 years, they'll be paying four times what they're currently paying. For this reason, it's absolutely essential and critical that you evaluate your current plan that you're on, understanding that as you get older, it's likely that the use of your medical scheme will be greater. And joining me this evening is Kevin Aaron, Principal Officer of MedShield Medical Scheme, and Dr. Katrachau Matudi, Managing Director, Board of Healthcare Funders. Good to have you both on the program. Hi, Brian. My first question to you, Katrachau, there's been a lot of comment in this week's press regarding Sizwe Hosmed, which is now under statutory management. Do members need to be concerned? I would say at the moment, no. Um, the Council for Medical Schemes as the regulator has got a number of instruments and tools at its disposal to one, regulate the industry, and secondly, to be able to provide the necessary oversight over schemes. Uh, and this range from um, uh, management uh, and statutory management as per the CISA pronouncement, and then on the extreme end is curatorship. Now, because of uh, financial challenges that the scheme finds itself under following the merger, uh, the council found it necessary to put it under statutory management. What it means is that um, the board and the principal officer continue to have control on the scheme, but there is somebody appointed by the council to uh, provide close monitoring and uh, assistance uh, to the scheme. And this was brought on by uh, the sudden decline in the reserves of the schemes. When season and host met, uh, match, their um, solvency ratio was about above 40%. Uh, but due, due to certain decisions around pricing of benefits, etc. This has reduced to just over 25% as per last year's report. And that brought the um, the concern from the register. So I would say at the moment, uh, no. Kevin, it's a, and, 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 and I don't want to move away. I don't want anyone to, to think that I'm putting any, any, any um, problem into what may be happening there. But let's talk about smaller schemes. I mean, you, your, your medical scheme, uh, I, I understand from a discussion, it is growing, but it is a problem for smaller schemes if, 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 if younger members aren't joining these schemes and actually helping to cross-subsidise older members. How, how, how do you deal with it uh, in, in your medical aid? Thanks, Brian. It's a, it's a major problem. I, um, I, I had a look at some stats. Obviously, I'm the principal officer of Metro Medical Scheme. So I had, had a look at some stats. And I just want to give your listeners uh, an indication how critical it is to get younger members into a medical scheme from a cross-subsidization perspective, which is the basis of how a medical scheme works. So if you look at the, um, the loss ratio, the claims ratio, which would be probably a better term, um, when I look at the whole of 2023, um, when you look at between the ages of 40 and 45, we have a claims ratio on average of about 63% for that age range. When it goes to 60 to 65 year olds, the claims ratio increases to 108%, which means that um, in that age range, people are actually claiming more than what they're actually paying in terms of their contribution. And if you move from 65 to 70 in that five-year ban, the claims ratio goes to 134%. So basically, that just shows you the difference between what happens. And it's a natural function. As people age, they get sicker, they've got chronic diseases, they end up in hospital more likely, and it's more expensive. And therefore, you need to cross-subsidize them with younger people who typically are not going to end up in in hospital. If you don't have that, um, the reality is your scheme is going to age, and the only thing that you can really do uh, to address it is either cut benefits, which actually doesn't really help, or you have high contribution increases. 
or alternatively, as in the case of Sizwe Hosmed, um, your solvency decreases to a level that you go into what I call the, the aeroplane nosedive. So it's probably the most critical thing for a medical scheme to find um, a way to attract younger people into the scheme. From our perspective, we don't even look at the numbers in terms of how large our scheme is. We have been growing. We're sitting at just under 72,000 principal members. It, it, it doesn't interest me at all. What interests me, quite frankly, is the split between how many young people have we got on an option and how many older people have we got on that option. Because if you don't have the right mix, then you don't get the cross-subsidization effect, and ultimately you end up with high contribution increases. The minute you have high contribution increases, the first people who leave your medical scheme are the young and healthy, because mm -hmm. affordability is an issue, and they don't expect to actually end up in hospital. So it's absolutely critical, and that's again why it's so challenging for a medical scheme that the Council for Medical Schemes has still not approved the low-cost benefit option sort of framework um, to allow medical schemes to compete with the health insurers who can put out very cheap products that are not regulated by prescribed minimum benefits or solvency requirements. Medical schemes are not allowed to do it. And in the environment we have, what you're finding is it's increasingly difficult to attract young and healthy people. If I can just say, and sorry for, for the long explanation, is that the challenge one also has is that if you design a product for young and healthy people um, and you make it very affordable, the risk you run is that you have a buy-down impact from older people who are entitled and allowed to buy down onto these, pro uh, onto these options. So it's a very, very complex juggling act to first of all attract the young and healthy and then to ensure that you have the right mix and you don't have all elder people buying down onto products designed for younger people because of the affordability of those options. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Kevin. I, I'm going to come back to a question because you did raise something, but I just want to get to Katrika. Katrika, please explain to our viewers what role the Board of Healthcare Funders plays. Do they represent medical aids or do they represent the individuals? So the, the Board of Healthcare Funders is a, a, a voluntary association for uh, health funders, including medical aid scheme. So the, the direct clients are uh, the schemes themselves. However, the work that we do is actually intended to benefit the beneficiaries, although the beneficiaries cannot join directly. If you think about the impact of our work, it's basically at three levels. There's work that, uh, and, and that's the bulk of, of what we do, that is uh, um, aimed at the industry. So um, uh, uh, those issues that affect the entire industry will draw attention. Um, for example, any legislative or regulatory matters uh, or health reform issues that have an impact, not just on the medical aid sector, but on the healthcare sector in general, will draw our attention and will focus uh, on that. We also do scheme specific work. Uh, if, for example, Medshield as a member has got a particular issue, so we do also run an advisory uh, section. We can do scheme specific work. But all the things that we do, be it from a, a health policy, impact analysis, uh, tools, uh, derivation and implementation, uh, are actually aimed at impacting the beneficiary because we are focusing on making sure that one, uh, the system is affordable uh, uh, for, for members, uh, promotes access, and that ends up with a sustainable healthcare system, and that includes the sustainability of the medical schemes themselves. Katka, does the organization have any teeth? Does anyone, does it, no one has, because it's a voluntary organization, no one has to take notes. I mean, I think of one thing, why is the Council for Medical Schemes not approving low-cost schemes? What are board funders doing about getting them to understand how important this is? It's been going on for a couple of years now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's actually been more than a couple of years. Um, if you think back uh, historically, I think the High Court ruling was around 2015, thereabouts. At that time, the schemes were concerned uh, about um, uh, the proliferation 
um, of these uh, primary care products that were uh, largely uh, run by um, health insurers rather than medical aid schemes. Uh, schemes then approached the courts to make a declaration that um, these insurers are actually doing the business of medical scheme. And that uh, um, was agreed upon. And they were given um, a period of two years to actually uh, develop a framework. And by they, I mean the council and the Department of Health to develop a framework which will see the transference of the policyholders from the insurance uh, companies into the medical aid scheme. Two years has become uh, eight years uh, now. Um, we, we are concerned because we've had many dialogues. We've participated in various stakeholder engagements with the council advisory uh, committees that so to, to try and, and draft uh, this framework to, to fast track the pro, uh, process. This led to a level of frustration uh, and uh, early uh, last year, we actually then approached the courts to force the hand of the council to one, first develop the, uh, or fast track the development of the framework, which will see the, the transference of policy uh, uh, holders. Um, and secondly, allow the schemes in the interim while that is going on to provide uh, this cover because it's solely uh, exempting health insurer to provide the cover. We, we, we have a firm belief that this has been stalled because there is a notion that a successful LCBO uh, implementation process will actually undermine uh, the National Health Insurance uh, um, uh, Fund uh, uh, implementation. Kevin, your comments on this before we go, we go, before we get to our break, how do you feel? I mean, I, I, you and I have behind the scenes had chatted. Why do you think there's a delay? Brian, I think it's exactly as uh, Katleko has said. Um, it's very frustrating. I mean, uh, our, our scheme has submitted for three years in a row, and uh, for 2025, we'll again be submitting um, LCBO options to the council for approval. Um, we've never had approval. They've declined it every time. The, there's uh, no reason. In fact, the reasoning is almost absurd. They actually say that you haven't made a motivation that, that makes it um, exceptional for your scheme as opposed to the industry. So, you know, the bottom line is the playing fields are not level. Health insurers are able to put forward primary health solutions for young people, um, which includes often um, some form of a hospital benefit. They are not regulated in terms of prescribed minimum benefits, which typically make up about 900 rand of a medical scheme's uh, pricing. Um, so the playing fields are not level, and, and therefore what you find is the, the health insurance products are 